please welcome Dr. John Abraham. It's a pleasure to come out today, and uh, it's a real treat to have this kind of attendance uh, on, a, on an early Sunday morning, so thank you very much. Um, the research that I do in my daily life is primarily on oceans and on renewable energy generation and on what's called paleoclimate. So I work with organizations to try to, to monitor the planet to figure out how fast our changes occur. And the most critical part of our planet is the oceans because they're so important in gobbling up uh, the extra heat that's going into the earth. So that's just a very brief statement of all of my background. So these are the main topics I'm going to go over. I'm happy to make these slides available either through the, uh, the, the, the church itself, uh, online, I have cards, people can contact me afterwards. So how many of you have heard that there is a debate? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So it turns out when you talk to scientists studying this area, there's an incredibly strong consensus of what's happening. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some facts. Now, these are facts that are not in dispute. The interpretation of these facts is in dispute. So let's go through some of the things that we've observed. First, humans have caused a 40% increase in carbon dioxide. It is a greenhouse gas. We've actually known that since the 1800s. The Earth has warmed by over a degree Fahrenheit in the last 100 years. The atmosphere is warm. The oceans, which is what I study, is warm. The Earth is warmer than probably 2,000 years. Greenhouse gas levels are high. The Arctic ice is lost. Losing ice, poles are warming. Glacier ice loss. And the ocean is becoming acidic, more acidic, uh, or less alkaline. Now, those are facts. Those are things that we measure. Those are things we've observed. Now, how do you interpret those facts? If you look at the most active climate scientists, the ones who are publishing the most, 97% of them say that these are connected. Humans are emitting a carbon dioxide. It's a greenhouse gas. The Earth should warm. It is warm. Hmm, that's connected. About 2% of active climate scientists say, well, we don't know yet, let's wait and see. And about 1% say, it's not happening, go home and have it. <laughs> now, with that level of consensus, what is the appropriate action to take? And I'm actually going to go through the data in some more detail uh, as we go on, but I want to set the stage about this consensus. I mean, imagine you go to a doctor and you get, uh, you you have an affliction identified. You've got this problem, but we can take action now to correct the problem. Let's say you don't like that opinion, so you go to 100 doctors. <coughs> and let's say 97 of them say the same thing. 3% say no. What would you do? What is the level of agreement that we expect when we make decisions in our everyday life? But it's not just that the Earth is warming. This is one of the things that has uh, been very impactful to the scientific community. It's warming in the right way. What do I mean by that? The sun could be causing the warming. Let's say the sun was getting hotter. It's not, but let's say it was. Would you expect days to be warming more when the sun is shining or nights? <coughs> days, right? Not a trick question. We're observing the opposite. We're observing nights to be warming more than days, and we're observing the poles where less sun shines to be warming faster than the, the tropics, the equator. That one probably wouldn't happen if it were the sun. If the sun were causing the warming, sunlight passes through the entire atmosphere. We would expect the entire atmosphere to be warming. That's not happening. We're actually observing heat being held down close to Earth. The upper part of the atmosphere is getting colder. <laughs> we're holding the heat down. So it's not just that we're seeing changes. They have the fingerprints of human emission. And that's one of the compelling items. A bit about the greenhouse effect. 
I'm actually going to crouch down here so people can see. Sunlight passes through the atmosphere. This is visible sunlight. The Earth sends back its own energy. It's called infrared energy. Now that energy is intercepted by the atmosphere and much of it is sent back to Earth. That is the greenhouse effect in a nutshell. If humans weren't around, we would have a greenhouse effect. The natural greenhouse effect is what makes this world habitable. If we didn't have it, we would be an ice ball Earth. The question isn't do we have the greenhouse effect or not. The question is what happens when we make it more powerful. If we go to our nearest neighbors, Mercury, Venus, you would expect Mercury to be hotter than Venus. It's closer to the sun. But it's not. Why is Venus 525 degrees hotter than Mercury? It's because Venus has a powerful greenhouse atmosphere. Venus's atmosphere is almost entirely carbon dioxide. It's almost entirely greenhouse gases. So our nearest neighbors show that uh, the greenhouse effect has a real impact on climate temperatures. So let's, let's do some investigation. Let me ask the question, are greenhouse gases going up? That's the first question to ask. This is one of the most famous curves in all of science. It's called the Keeling Curve. It's named after a man named Charles David Keeling, who began measuring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in 1957. This is today. The red line is the carbon dioxide. It has clearly gone up. Clearly gone up. He was so crazy about measuring carbon dioxide that he missed the birth of his first child. <laughs> he was out, and I talked to his kid, Ralph uh, Keeley, um, who, who laughs about it now, but this, uh, this curve, this data, is a clear indication that carbon dioxide is going up. No one really doubts that carbon dioxide is going up, by the way. If we go back 2,000 years in time, this is 2,000 years ago. This is today. Three of the most important greenhouse gases that humans emit were constant, 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 and then all of a sudden they shot up. Coincident with the Industrial Revolution. Now, these aren't the only greenhouse gases. In fact, the most important one that I haven't listed here is water vapor, humidity. Humidity is actually the most powerful greenhouse gas, but the reason why we're not so concerned, we are concerned about it, but uh, we're, we're not concerned of our emissions of water vapor because the thing that controls water vapor is the ocean. So I put these on here because they are associated with human emissions. By the way, if people have questions, feel free to get yeah. um, So where was that chart taken from? Right oh, the data here? Um, how this? Do you, how do you measure those? Yeah, I'm, I actually will talk about how right. measurements were made. That's a great question. So where, uh, where do we get emissions? Well, electricity is one of the most important sources. Coal is used to produce about 40% of our electricity. And each kilowatt hour of coal, when you look, uh, coal power, when you look at your bill, is about 2 pounds of CO2 gas for 18 cubic feet. So imagine that you get your bill at the end of the month. And for every kilowatt hour of energy you've used, it's 18 cubic feet of space of carbon dioxide. Another major source is transportation. One gallon of gas, oops, I think I the way far. One gallon of gas burnt in a car releases about 20 pounds of CO2. Now that's amazing because a gallon of gas only weighs about seven pounds. The weight of carbon dioxide coming out the tailpipe is almost three times heavier than the liquid you put in the gas tank. <coughs> now, every gallon of gas is 173 cubic feet of space of carbon dioxide. Now, I'm not suge suggesting we turn off all electricity and we quit driving, or that we dismantle modern society and go back to living as cave people. The reason why I show these two slides is if we're going to make smart decisions to deal with this problem, we at least have to know where the sources are. We have to make smart, targeted decisions. And this helps quantify uh, some of the impacts of energy sources. So our temperature is going up. 
This is a graph from NASA. I'm going to show graphs from other folks as well. Each white dot is the average temperature of the planet in any given year. So this year it was hot, this year it was cold. Hot, cold, and so forth. The data goes back to 1880. What we want to ask is, is there a trend? Is the world heating up? And just, by, by the way, this is 2012. Don't worry about the jumps up or down. When temperatures are cold, like here or here, it's what's called a La Nina cycle. It's an ocean current in the Pacific, an ocean fluctuation. When years are hot, it's usually an El Nino. We're not concerned about the year-to-year -year variation. We're concerned about the trend. Here are the top 10 hottest years on record in order. I mean, you can see this from the graph, but that's pretty astounding. But it's not just NASA. These are five different organizations. NASA is actually this top one. <coughs> These are five different organizations, each with their own temperature measurements. They all show temperatures are increasing. They all do it a little differently. And in fact, I should add to this, uh, the, there was a Berkeley study done, paid for in part by the Koch brothers. And their data actually showed warming faster than NASA. So we, we could now add uh, the Koch brothers, and they have a slightly higher increase. So it doesn't matter who's taking the data. Everyone is, everyone's in agreement that the temperatures are rising. So when you see, by the way, sometimes I have things like this. When you see something like this, it's a citation to a paper. So you could actually go get the paper uh, if you're interested in, the, in finding the actual data. Now, some people. <clears throat> We'll take a, a, a hot year and then a cold year, and they'll incorrectly conclude the Earth is not warming. And the way that's done is, here's an example. You might take 1998, which was very hot. It was a super El Nino year. And you might take 2008, which was very cold, relatively to its neighbors. And if you connect those two, you may say, well, the Earth hasn't, the Earth is cool for the last 10 years. But scientists don't look at the year-to-year -year fluctuations. They look at the long-term trend. So the long-term trend is clearly upwards. But we're going to go back further in time. I'm actually going to skip this graph. I'm going to go right to this one. And by the way, my wife tells me every time I have a graph, half the people fall asleep. <laughs> I'm getting close. Did someone say that's correct? <laughs> I'm getting close to the end of the graphs. <laughs> this graph goes back 400,000 years. Here's today. Here's 400,000 years ago. There are two curves. The red curve is temperature. I'm going to explain how we get temperature. The green curve is greenhouse gas forcing, greenhouse gases. Now you look at those and you say, hmm. <laughs> Hmm, is there a coincidence? Are those, do those two things go together? And the answer is yes, they do. Now, I am not saying that cave people had coal plants, that they burnt 400, that burnt coal in 400,000 years ago. All I'm saying in all this graph shows is that the two things are locked together, we call them handcuffed. When one moves, the other moves. When temperatures go up, greenhouse gases go up. When greenhouse gases go up, temperatures go up and vice versa. They are locked together. Now, what would make us think we're now shooting? We have, actually, I'll go back to that last slide just because this is such a good group. Um, <laughs> 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 These three curves are greenhouse gas levels back uh, 600,000 years. And there we are right now. We're off the charts in the last 600,000 years. Those stars are our current greenhouse gas levels. Okay, so how do we know this? Did we have airport temperature sensors 100,000 years ago? Did we have Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts with thermometers and rain gauges? No, it, it, we didn't. We use what are called proxies. Now, forget what's on the slide for right now. Let's just talk camping. How many people like to camp, have camped? Okay, all of us, right? Now, let's say you go to northern Minnesota, 
you go camping and you bring a shovel for some reason. I don't know why, but you brought a shovel. And while everyone else is roasting s'mores, you start digging. Now let's say you dig three or four feet down and you discover crocodile skeletons and palm fronds. What would you conclude about the weather years and years ago? It had been warm, right? In fact, you can look at pollen. If you find tropical plant pollen in the ground, you conclude it's been very warm. You can look at the shells of creatures in the ocean. You can look at the growth rate of trees. You can look at the type of snow that falls on top of Greenland and Antarctica. These are signals from nature that tell us what the temperature is. Here it is one of the, perhaps the most important, one of the most important proxies that's called an ice core. Here's someone digging out an ice core that are about six inches in diameter. They can go down two miles. They can go back in time 800,000 years. And if you take an ice core, this is a one meter long section photographed. You can see the annual bands. Snow falls, and then the next year snow falls, and you get these rings. And if you take this ice core back to the lab, and if you melt it, the atmosphere is released into your lab. And when the atmosphere is released, you can measure how much carbon dioxide there was, how much of these other things gases. <laughs> so you count back the rings, you have time. You melt the snow, you get the atmosphere. And then you can deduce the temperature based on what's called the isotope of snow. Basically, you get temperature, time, and greenhouse gases, and that's how you get a curve like this one. So, I've talked enough about the past, where we've been. Let's talk about where we're going. What's going to happen? Well, scientists, we, we don't know where we're going because a lot of it depends on groups like this. A lot of it depends on what humans do. We don't know if humans are going to take seriously this issue, this risk, and take action. Or are humans going to go on a business as usual plan and just burn all the fossil fuels around? So what scientists do is they, they come up with what are called scenarios. These are six scenarios. Each scenario has a column. I just want you to focus on these two. The top graph is emissions. So this is carbon dioxide going up. This would be carbon dioxide leveling off and then starting to go down. So this would be a worst case scenario, best case scenario. So now, if we're on a worst case or a best case path, what happens to temperature? This is the temperature rise we'll see on the worst case path, and then that's the temperature rise we'll see on the best case path. Now, what do we take away from this? We take a couple of things. What we do really matters. What we do is humans are the biggest uncertainty in the climate. The second thing is time matters. The quicker you take action, the easier it is to stop this problem. The Earth climate is sort of like a train. It's really heavy. The Earth is heavy. And you can't just stop. I mean, if we decided tomorrow to shut down our coal power plant, we still have a lot of warming in the pipeline because you can't just get the carbon dioxide out of the air. It takes decades or centuries. So time matters. This is, now I really think I'm done with this. This is temperatures 1000 AD and then here it is, or common era AD. Here it is today. That's what we're concerned about. This is, oops, that's what's coming. So you think about the summer we had. I mean, the summer we had with a drought that was about $35 billion and Hurricane Sandy, which was about 60 to $70 billion. Uh, I'm going to cover some other things that we're seeing in nature. Uh, this is a photograph of the Arctic ice sheet. It was equal to the United States minus Arizona. And that's where, the white was where it was in 1980. That's how much was lost through 2005. This is how much was lost in 2007. And then that was last year. We lost Texas last year. And when you put it on those scales, this is a huge amount of ice that we're losing. Why do we care about ice? 
we care because we can maybe get this thing to work. Ice, when it's there, reflects sunlight. But when the ice melts, it exposes dark water, which allows more energy to be absorbed. It's called a vicious cycle. Yeah. It's actually worse than that because the volume loss is bigger than the surface loss. That's the exactly area. right. The, that, that is a very good point. The area loss that we've seen, and let me go back to this slide. 20% area loss. Yeah. 80%. Well, it's actually, yeah, it's, this shows the reduction of area, which is if you have a satellite you're looking down, you see the area. We lost about 50%, but you're, but you're exactly right. 80% volume because it's actually also melting from the bottom. So uh, I didn't show that because it would be too scary. Except <laughs> <laughs> you can book a cruise over the uh, North Pole after that. <laughs> That's right. Well, and shipping companies are now uh, getting ready to ship through the, the Arctic and uh, oil exploration companies are going to go there. Um, which is sort of ironic. Uh, That'll help. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is a moulin. This is a river of water that forms on top of an ice sheet. And as it flows, it goes down into these uh, holes. You'll see an ice, you'll see a melt pond. And then from that melt pond, you'll see a rivulet of water flow downwards. And that water flows and gets between the ice and the land. And it lubricates the base and causes the ice to flow faster toward See, that was worth it. <laughs> I have to tell you, I gave a talk in Red Wing on Earth Day, and it was sort of ironic. I almost couldn't make it home because of the snow. <laughs> and then, and then I, I gave a talk in St. Peter uh, Friday, and then here today, and I finally said, you know, I've got to dial up some hot weather. Because it makes my job a lot easier. And so thank you can you. thank the warm weather. <laughs> Okay, let's go down to the uh, Antarctic. There's the light Larsen B ice shelf uh, called out in red. It's about the size of Rhode Island. It's been there for over 14,000 years. Here's a satellite image in late January, late February, early March. Collapsed in a month and a half. This shocked the scientific community that something this large could collapse that fast. Uh, the Wilkins ice shelf also in Antarctica has collapsed. So we're starting to see the decay of these ice shelves. Here's a before and after picture of an alpine glacier taken from the same location. Here's a before, this is early 1900s, <coughs> recently. Portage Glacier, uh, Alaska on the left, 1914 and then 2004. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the other impacts we're seeing. Um, what, I mean, yeah, it's great for glaciers to melt, and it, as long as we don't rely upon them for our drinking water, it's not going to affect us directly, although it will affect us indirectly. But what do we see? Well, this is U.S. drought monitor <coughs> last summer. Now, pay attention to Illinois and Indiana. They had pretty severe drought last year, right? Here it was February 12th. It actually got worse in some of the Midwestern states. Look at Indiana and Illinois, all of a sudden, aren't under much drought. Does anyone know what's happening there now? Flooding. Flooding. Yes. That's right. They've gone from drought to flooding. And I'm going to talk about that. It's a phrase that I thought I coined about a month ago, weather whiplash, but I discovered Paul Douglas used it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last year, the red states were warmest on record. The orange states were just much above average. So what I'm going to talk about now, uh, and uh, then we'll get to, we'll sort of tie this, tie this up, bring it together, and talk about solutions. One, this is a breaking field of science, what I'm going to talk about on this side. It has to do with the extremes that we're seeing. We're not just seeing the Earth warm sort of gradually and uniformly. We're seeing the extremes happen. We're going from one side to the other more violently. Let's think about two winters ago. Heavy, heavy, heavy snow. Then last winter, almost no winter. And then this year, this very late and heavy contribution to snow. We're going back and forth. We had dry summers, but then we've had three 1,000 year floods in southern Minnesota. And now we're back to uh, some at least moderate flood, at least in northern Minnesota. We've had 
the Duluth flood. I mean, 10 inches of rain seals in the street. Now, that's a pretty in incredible weather phenomenon. Uh, and then I mentioned uh, we've had flooding and droughts in the Midwest. So what's happening? Well, there is something called, there are jet streams in our environment. And when the jet stream is nice and well behaved, it goes around the pole sort of in a circle. And it does that. Imagine that you, you, t you have a bucket of water and you swing it around your arm. The water will stay in the bucket because your arm is pulling the bucket towards you. In the same way, you have high pressure air here, low pressure air, it pushes that jet stream in a circle. So the pressures in the Arctic keep the jet stream going like this. Now what's happened in the Arctic is we've lost so much ice that we've raised the pressure. So we have less of a pulling force on the jet stream. And the jet stream is doing more of this. Now, why do we care? Well, if you're under the jet stream, you're going to be pretty warm. If you're over the jet stream, you're going to be pretty cold. So imagine this whole thing is moving west to east. Someone sitting here seems, re seems really warm, really cold, really warm. So there are bigger swings in the type of weather we've seen. I think I have some pictures of jets, very recent jet streams. Here's a jet stream, uh, April 12th. Look at that. It comes all the way down here. Now the jet stream does meander even without human emissions and global warming. It's just that it meanders more. Here was the jet stream uh, April 19th. Now you would expect, based on what I said, you'd expect everything above the jet stream to be cold. Okay? Let's see. I'm going to show you temperatures. Pretty good, right? So we had real warmth in the south and east, but we had cold in the central part. Uh, I'm going to show a couple other slides. Um, this is a topological map of Bangladesh. And the reason why I showed that jet stream is because I can't tell you how many people say, well, it's snowing in Minnesota in April, the global warming is ending. So I thought it was important to talk about it. <laughs> this is Bangladesh, uh, Asia, with a focus on Bangladesh and their topology, how high they are above sea level. Bangladesh is 160 million people. Now, what happens if you're India and you have even a small fraction of those people dislocated by rising sea level? This would be southeast U.S. with one meter, three, six. Miami is gone. We cannot save Miami. We cannot dike Miami. Okay, you've heard it here. We, 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 I can't tell you when, but Miami cannot be saved. No. Some people may have gone to Miami and not had a very good time and may not care about it, but, <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is there is a cost. There is a cost to these uh, occurrences. So how much will oceans rise if sea level, uh, if, if various things happen, if Greenland melted seven meters, 23 feet? If the western part of Antarctica melted five meters, or about 17 feet, those are the two that scientists are most concerned about. If all of that Antarctica melted 270 feet, most scientists don't think this will happen, but some people are starting to say that these are inevitable. Now, to melt Greenland, it may take three, four, five hundred years. We don't know how fast it will occur. But once it starts, you can't stop it. So, um, these numbers are pretty astonishing. I'm going to just hit a couple other things and then we will get the solution. Lower crop yields, we saw that this year in the US. Ocean acidification, that's actually my biggest concern and it's something uh, that hasn't been addressed in the, uh, in the popular press. What we're doing with the ocean is we're putting so much carbon in the atmosphere, we're actually doing a reverse soda can. You know, if you take a soda can, you shake it and then you open it up, you get the fizz. That's carbon dioxide coming out of the soda. It's a carbonated beverage. 
we're actually putting carbon dioxide into the water. It's changing the pH. Now, why do we care? If you are a shell-forming creature, some creatures have a hard time keeping you forming their shells. And because many of those creatures are at the base of the food chain, it's particularly concerning. Uh, redistribution of water, the general consensus is the areas that are wet now will become wetter. The areas that are dry will become drier. And the rains and snow will occur in heavier downbursts. So what it means for Minnesota is we're really not going to change that much in annual precipitation, but we'll get bigger rainfalls. Extreme events. Now, hurricanes is interesting because the jury is still out, actually. Uh, there are two things happening. The warm sea levels, the warm sea waters make hurricanes more powerful, but there's something else in the atmosphere called shear which is making them less likely. So the general consensus is there will be fewer and more powerful hurricanes. Invasive species and so forth. So what do we do? Well, if this were the Olympics of emissions, <laughs> USA and Canada, and this is a few years old, I wouldn't be surprised if Australia and Canada passed this. In fact, I think they have. Uh, we are by far and away the top emitters. This is per capita. Now, people focus on China a lot, and China is a huge emitter, and as a country, they emit more than us. And much of it is our uh, manufacturing, which we've outsourced to China. But, um, but per capita, they emit far uh, less than we do. But basically, to solve this problem, everyone has to be on board. It's not an us versus them situation. If we look at, if we pull out 100 carbon dioxide atoms out of the atmosphere, about 28% of them are from the US. So we're about 5% of the world's population and about a quarter. Yeah. Um, that's not US households. That's US industry US. and everything. That's right. Yep. right. I think that's Including important to make that. It's including everything for the country. Now, um, I, I, and I think with respect to manufacturing, it's manufacturing onshore. So let's say it's a US company making something in China that's then shipped to the US. I, I'm pretty sure that counts under China. But yeah, this would include military, domestic, commercial. So what do we do? Well, our emissions are set to go up between 10, 2010 and 2050. Uh, this is the citation you were looking for, Pakala and Sakala. Uh, what do we do? Do we have a silver bullet? No, but we've got silver buckshot. <laughs> you do a lot of things that can have an impact. And this is the exciting part. This problem is solvable. I mean, a significant part of emissions are due to deforestation. We know how to plant trees. We know how to reforest. A lot of our emissions are due to unwise, wasteful use of energy. We can use energy more wisely. And as a result, you'll save money. I mean, I drive a car that gets about 50 miles a gallon. The side effect to me is, um, if my wife would let me keep that money, I would have back problems because my wallet would be thicker. <laughs> I mean, my life doesn't suffer because I, I have an efficient car. Many of you probably have efficient, does anyone here have a Prius? How, when gas goes to four dollars a gallon, yeah, who cares, right? Some of you have done home energy audits. I did one two years ago, and in the first year, I saved all the all the money that I cost for the energy audit and the retrofits on the house. So, using our energy more wisely is critical here. I, you think about a gallon of gasoline, you know, a gallon. It's not that much. It's got so much energy, it will take an SUV, push it 60 miles an hour for 20 miles. That's a lot of energy. We should use that precious resource wisely. We shouldn't waste it. Who makes gasoline? No one. Microbes made it millions of years ago, made the basic ingredients. So once these precious resources are gone, we are going to be without them. And so we should use them more wisely. So the idea here, and you may not agree with the wedges, and there are certainly more wedges that I would put on here, but the idea is you do a bunch of things that add together to manage your problem. And we can do many of these, or most of them, with today's technology. Yeah? 
before you go too far into this, um, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Back a bit. So, so I understand something of how the two percent of scientists are thinking. If you're really cautious, you're worried about type yeah. two errors. You know, yeah, yeah. Okay. What are the one percent thinking, and how do they justify their thinking? I mean, how can how can they say this? Nothing <coughs> um, you can do, or whatever they're saying. Here is the. Um, you know, if you were really to ask me, I think the 1% don't really believe what they're saying. I mean, the 2% say, we don't know for sure that they're connected. I mean, let me give you an, an example argument. Um, there is an argument that long-term fluctuations in oceans that we haven't really, we don't really understand could be causing these and we need to wait and see. Now, one of the arguments against that is we know, we actually have satellites that measure how much energy is going into the Earth. We know the Earth is out of whack. We can measure it. And so we know the Earth should be heating just based on those satellite measurements. But some people say, well, we think that the Earth uh, you know, we, we've got these oceans, especially in the Pacific and the Atlantic, and we think that they have these long-term cycles which will um, either swamp out or they'll, they're, they're making us think there's more warming than there is. That's the argument. Um, yeah, one of the arguments is the CO2 saturation argument. Uh, CO2 uh, responds around the 15 micron area in Earth's yes. thermal, <coughs> thermal infrared. And so most of that uh, thermal infrared in that area is already being absorbed by CO2, which means more CO2 doesn't really do much. Well, there, uh, there's, there are other arguments. Yeah, I mean, there's well, a half truth. One of the arguments yeah. Yeah. yeah, that the argument is that once you put a certain amount of CO2 in, more CO2 doesn't matter. And and it is there, there's a there's a part truth to that. If you if I add a CO2 molecule now, and then if I come in 10, 20, 30 years and I add another one, the one I added first does more does more. Okay, and that's true. Um, there used to be this idea that there would be a saturation, and it right. turns out there's something called pressure broadening. That, that, <coughs> yeah. The, yeah. And so, so that, you're right. There are these ideas. Now, most of the ideas <coughs> can be tested. I mean, the sun is the sun causing warming. Well, that can be tested, and it's pretty clear it's not. So, as these ideas are trotted out each year, scientists have to go in and test them and see if they hold water. But some of them. Can't test it. So, talk about ocean current cycles on the 50 year time frame. How do you test that? You have to wait 50 years. It's going to be too late. Why should we care about the 1%? I mean, if 99% believe what you're saying is yeah. true, <laughs> well, I don't just care overpower about the 1% yeah. and say, forget it, you're but wrong. In the scientific <laughs> community, we, we have. But the problem is that 1% has incredible, thank you, has incredible voice. I can't believe um, Let me tell you a funny story. Uh, uh, this week, Earth Day, an organization called the Heartland Institute, they're famous for putting up billboards in Chicago uh, associating climate change, people who are concerned about climate change to Ted Kaczynski, the Unibomber. Okay? So they're pretty a radical group. They sent out 100,000 books to teachers, civic leaders, all over the country on Earth Day, talking about this being a hoax. 100,000 books, all in one day. Now, we've got a bunch of scientists who are working on climate communication without pay. I have a daytime job that keeps me fully employed. So, so we're fighting against very rich and powerful organizations. But one thing that's really bothered me, uh, I set up an organization called the Climate Science Rapid Response Team. It was in response to the fact that, uh, uh, and 1030 is our time. Drop okay. yeah. uh, mm -hmm. If, let's say you're a reporter, and you want to do a story about Arctic ice, or algae biofuels, or wind power, or drought, or hurricanes, what do you do? Well, there are a lot of organizations that will put forward their experts, like the Heartland Institute. And you can, they've been on public radio right here in Minnesota. But how do you know that they're experts? Wouldn't it be great if you could call someone 
and they would connect you to a scientist who works in that area. So in late 2010, I set up a group called the Climate Science Rapid Response Team. It's unfunded. We have a website. And if you're a reporter, you can go online, you put the question in, your organization, your deadline. And often the deadlines are within a few hours. And we immediately, we have a Rolodex of scientists who agree to do interviews, be on TV, do print media interviews. And we immediately call them and we, we're a connection, we're a matchmaking service. And, and that's been pretty effective. We probably, well, we've had people on CNN, uh, I mean, all the major news organizations. But, but really, we are outgunned, and those 1% are called upon time and time and time and time again. In fact, I'll tell you the three most popular 1%ers uh, Dick Lindzen, uh, Roy uh, Spencer, and John Christie. And they're, what's it? So, you know, if, if you're going to have a contrarian scientist on, it's 90% of the time going to be them. And there, there's just such a mechanism to get these folks a voice. They have a, they have a, a, a sounding board that is far larger than their population. Who funds them? Well, um, there are organizations that do fund people. The three I mentioned, I don't... I have no reason to believe that they take funding when they go on and, and, and do shows, but but they. Um, Where do they work? Lindsay's retired from MIT. Uh, John, Christine, and Roy Spencer are at University of Alabama, but but there are a lot of non-scientists who. The guy who wrote this book, hundred thousand copies go out. He's not a climate scientist. So, I mean, the the cost of that book may have been. $500,000 to produce mail out. I mean, how do, you, how do you compete with that? How do you compete with the Cato Institute? How do you compete with um, all of these organizations? And what's interesting, and I talked to my colleagues, scientists, I mean, we're being just creamed in public relations area. I mean, Ken Cuccinella out of Virginia has launched an investigation against one of the most famous climate scientists, Mike Mann, trying to get private emails. And so, so you've got a lot of scientists. When scientists speak out, many of them are taking a big risk. Every time I get mail without a return address, I know it's hate mail. Usually it's funny. The number of misspellings per sentence is pretty high. <laughs> but, you know, scientists, we don't go in to this topic to combat people personally in the media, it's not fun. And how do you convince young scientists that it's something important, it's something that they should do when you're not rewarded professionally? I mean, at the end of the year, when I go into my boss and tell him the things I did, coming to give this talk is not one of the things that counts. <laughs> and so you're asking people to take time out of their, their deal. I, I've probably spent about 2,000 hours on climate communication in the last two years. Un unpaid. I mean, that's that's a big chunk of time. You do it because it's important. So why do I do this? This region. So uh, I've got two daughters, ages uh, seven and six. This is Lily. She was maybe three or four at the time this was taken. But she's now six. And um, she and I took a bike ride to the local lake, and she pulled cattails last night. This is Olivia. Uh, she's seven. They both love science, they love the earth. And those daughters are going to ask me one or two questions. They're going to say, Dad, you knew. What did you do? <laughs> what did you do? Or they're going to say, Dad, how did your generation have the uncommon courage to take action to preserve this earth for us? And this is my new reason. This is my adopted daughter. This is a photo of her in her orphanage in Uganda. She was brought here to the United States last March. And I can tell you, climate change is impacting her country today. So that, you know, whenever I get hate mail on that what country, is she from? You got it. So what are the takeaway messages? There's four. And when I train scientists to communicate this in, in a variety of uh, environments, whether conservative, progressive, or middle of the road, here are the four arguments that I ask them to think about. We've known. We know. We've known it for 150 years. The basic science is pretty well established. We can solve it. 
<coughs> today with today's technology. Those wedges, we can start putting those wedges in and the quicker we do it, the better. Not only, and this is something that is really geared toward people who uh, call themselves fiscal conservatives, not only can we help the environment, we can create jobs. Yeah. Diversify our energy supply. I mean, has anyone driven through Wyndham, Minnesota? What do you see as you look across the corn? Corn, have you driven through recently? Have you seen the wind turbines? Wind turbines. And I mean, those that's revitalizing the economy of that part of the state. I would rather send a check for my electricity to a farmer in Wyndham than send our sons and daughters to defend oil routes in Iraq. National Security, the Department of Defense is all over this issue. They identify climate change as one of their biggest, if not their biggest long term risk. And then lastly, if anyone tells you it's too expensive to take action, it's too expensive not to. Doing nothing is a choice. Doing nothing is a choice that brought us a tremendous drop last year and Sandy. Sandy probably wouldn't have hit the coast were it not for that undulating jet stream. That jet stream caused Sandy to curve. Do you want to watch Sandy's path? Yeah. Took that strange curve. There was a blocking pattern, a high pressure zone out in the ocean that made it curve. It shouldn't have done that. $65 billion. In 2011, not last year, the year before 2011, the Texas drought cost that state $5.2 billion. $190 million in the Duluth floods. These things cost money. I am a firm believer that we should do reasonable, rational things to mitigate this problem and start now. If we're smart, we can not only help reduce the impacts of climate change, but we can also create an economy that will propel us into the next century. So with that, I want to thank everyone for listening. This has been a tremendous joy.